Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Equine Documentalist video casts. Today, I'm very excited to be with Martina Needhart. Um, and we're going to be talking about the hoof and its myofascial connections. So, Martina, could you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay. Um, I'm a veterinarian at the moment, stationed in Switzerland. I'm specialized in rehabilitation, chiropractic acupuncture, and I have a keen interest in feet. I do 80% horses and about 20% small animals. Excellent. And I'm really excited for this chat because um, I know we're both quite passionate about because um, in my work, I've focused my attention onto the relationship between the hoof and the rest of the body um, and how it affects, is affected by posture. So, and I know that's uh, very important to you as well, isn't it? Yeah, I think we have a different approach to it. I guess you as a farrier, it might come more from the feet and then what's happening up. And for me, it yeah. was my, more, I have problems up top why what is causing them but yeah. that's the connection i guess we're going to talk yeah, about that, today that's, so that's yeah that's the fluid relationship that uh, is going to be fun to talk about so i'm looking forward to that as we're seeing here that we're going to be talking about the relationship between the hoof and the body via the myofascial connection so martina maybe you can explain to us what is the myofascial system Yes. So what you see on the top picture there is a picture from an electromicroscope um, where you see muscle fibers and that white stuff around it is the fascia and in it that blue one on the side is a nerve. So you see it's everything is really nicely connected. Fascia is when you have a stake, the white stuff around it, that's what's fascia. Fascia is like a big net that connects everything and is surrounding everything. It's like a big, the big connection of everything. It surrounds every muscle. It goes into every tendon or it is the tendons and ligaments. It goes into the bone and even inside the bones, it connects the tendons to the bones and inside the bones, it goes further on and is responsible and helps with bone architecture inside there too. Um, it is responsible for transfer of power. It is responsible that muscles can slide against each other. That's the main part of it, the sliding motion. Everything needs to slide in the body. If one muscle is contracting, the other one needs to relax to be able. So these two muscles need to be able to slide against each other. Uh, nerves can't stretch they're just in an s shape and if everything stretches they just elongate into a straight line and when everything goes back to normal they go back into an s shape um, this is also sliding um, fascia is the main part that we need to move freely it is up there in a 3d net and connects everything. That's um, also what you might want to talk about it, the so-called transegrity. That means if you put pressure onto somewhere, it's gonna get through a net like a maze to another point and you have a reaction there. Um, yeah. A friend of so, mine, yeah. has a very nice <laughs> sentence, wherever you are, you're everywhere else. So if you change some little thing, you're gonna change the whole body. Yeah, absolutely. And, and looking at tensegrity, I put this, um, this image of the digit down here. And when you look at how, so it, the bone column on its own would just collapse, right? And it's all of the, it's all of the ligaments, all of the tendons, all of the annular ligaments, um, and of course, the myofascial tissue that um, is the tension that holds everything together. Um, and it's like you said, it's connected around the whole body. So like here in the digit, it holds everything up in the digit. Um, it also, that extends all the way into the body and that, that is tensegrity, isn't it? And, and, um, every single anatomical point in this digit is going to affect every other because they're all connected by 
by each other. And all of them are always under tension. We just change tension. There is never nothing. Yes, exactly. Uh, there were some other points that you wanted to make about fascia. I'll let you carry on. With yes, you. yes. Um, fascia is, like I said, it attaches the muscles to the bones and goes into the bone. But most of the muscles do not just attach at the bones. They attach into... Um, other fascia connections like dense structures like in the horses um, very famous one is tensor fasciolata or the lumbar fascia or something like that they're very very dense strong um, structures and by doing so by going further down over the joint they're actually causing a lever that means they're enhancing the power up to 40% of the strength that the muscle would normally have because they're prolonged the lever that we have. Um, when it's also like they have center of fusions, that means those um, force lines that go through the muscle and through the fascia, they kind of like come together somewhere else. And this is often where we see the problem. This is not where the problem origins. And this is why it's so important and also confusing when you work with fascia, because the problem is usually not where the origin of it is, because the vectors go away from the origin problem, because the tension, the body tries to distribute it evenly, but doesn't always succeed. And that's what we see afterwards. Yeah, so basically, um, because of the myofascial system, the, um, the issue could be completely on the other side of the body, potentially, couldn't it? Yes, yes, and, and it often is. Yeah, and that, and that helped that um, take us on to this image here where we can see uh, the myofascial lines and just how far they extend. Um, yes. So add some some more points about fascia before we move on to the yeah it's just a very nice um slide from the university of denmark um where you can see all that loose stuff that you can see that's connective tissue and then those little rings um these are vessels and then the dot up in the left that is so bluish this is actually a nerve so you can see everything is embedded in that net. And um, it connects, like I said, muscle to bone and also defines the bone structure inside because fascia is always following tension. And it, it does several things. It can also change tension. Like we said, depending on how structures are loading, the tension changes. And it is the most stretchable thing we have in the body. It usually stretches over 200% to let the muscles glide, to let the veins, vessels and nerves glide. It also contains over 90% of our free nerve endings that are responsible for proprioceptive input. That means our body knows where it is in space. If we're standing, if we're leaning, if we're straight or if we're um, doing a rotation. This is what the body tells it. If we have too much tension and the research at the moment doesn't know why, it changed from proprioceptive input into nociceptive input. Nociceptive input is a smart word for pain. So these free nerve endings can change from telling the body where they are to that they are sore. This is also explaining why certain postures or compensation occur with too much tension in certain fascia lines. Um, like I said, altered movement in the fascia layer um, causes a corrupted neurological input in the brain. So it gets wrong input. Instead of knowing where it is in the space, it got told there's pain. Yeah, well, so yeah, so going back to this image then that i created showing all the yes. fascia lines um so most most of the fascial lines connect into the hind foot 
Um, and so one of the main things we're going to be talking about today is um, how the conformation of the hind foot affects the whole body. I mean, the most important ones for you when you talk about the feet and, and what's really important for you are the dorsal lines, the superficial and the deep. These would be, I think, you just have the superficial blue one. So this is responsible for the extension of the neck, back and hip, and also for the flexion of the hind limb. This is what the blue line does. Um, it is um, put together by um, several muscles. You have the um, you have uh, the tendons that come up, the flexor flexor tendons that actually attach underneath the hoof um, and on P two, and then they follow up uh, the suspensory ligament, Achilles tendon, biceps femoris, semitendinosus, semimembranosus, the gluteals follow along the sacrotubral ligament around the tuber coxae. And then you have there, they go further on into the back muscles like erector spinae, longissimus spinalis, iliocostalis, and then they go back over into the neck area where they um, are supported, um, where they have the um, musculus semi-spinalis uh, and musculus longissimus cervicis and capitis. So they go directly up onto the neck and attach on behind there. So this is a very important line. And if this one's on the tension from the bottom, you can try it at yourself when you're standing and you lift up your um, feet so that your heels are down. That's when we put tension on that line in a human. You feel how your back is going into kyphosis and how your um, neck is coming down. So this is actually um, causing a hollow back and you, you lean backwards to release tension. So this is also something we're going to see in the horses later on. So so what we were saying before about um, it all being connected, any, any anatomical point along that superficial or deep dorsal line, if it's out of place, can cause tension anywhere else, can't it? Yes, yes. It, and it goes also the way back. So if you have a saddle that's compressing that line or you have a dental problem that's causing or a tack problem or ill-fitting bridle that's putting too much pressure on it on the head, you're going to get the same compensation along the line. Yeah, exactly. And then if we look at this image here, uh, we, can, we can clearly see if we look at the beige areas, just how the myofascia just connects all the way around, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. when, when you remember the picture you have before from the fascia, and you see here, these um, spots that are light colored, these are some of those broad fascia, um, fascia parts that I said, they're very, very thick um, and very strong. And this is where those lines cross over because they cross over, some of them cross over and make that, for example, in trot, the left hind and the right front are kind of like going in unity when they move, or if yeah. we are in a gallop, something like that. And where those most important areas are for crossing and to bear weight yes. or to give over tension, this is where we have those white areas. That's why this picture is so brilliant. It shows you where the most forces act on. Yeah. So going back to here, even though we've got um, the superficial dorsal line, for instance, mm -hmm. because, of, because of the broad myofascial plates, if you like, that we see in yeah. this, we can see that um, all of these lines are also connected to each other, aren't they? Yes, yes, because they're all interconnected. Um, it's really interesting when you dissect them, you can actually see how some of those fibers pull deeper down and some come up. And, and it's really, it's like a net, it's like a spider net interchanging. Yeah. And it's also how it's built up. It's not just these, like you said, these plates. They're the only 
strong ones. Everything else is very fine and is made like spider webs with little elastic, fine um, stretch lines that are, but it's just millions of them and they're making the, the fascia connection. Yeah. So one particular line um, or two lines, because obviously the, the doors, the deep and the superficial, they run together, right? On the, on the yes, deep. just just more or less in, in a, just in a little more depth, like you, you have, yeah. but you have more or less the same muscle layers. And this, this line here, which I've simplified in this image, has been linked, um, has linked the foot and lots of different higher pathologies. Yeah. Is these are the um, the current pathologies that have linked um, negative plantar angles or poor but poor dorso palmar balance in the feet with higher pathologies. So we've got Dyson who. Um, 2007, who mentioned proximal suspensory desmitis. Um, these are in, in time order. Man's Man 2010, who talks about gluteal pain, the link with gluteal pain. Um, and he also um, mentioned that horses that had negative plantar angles had this posture that we can see in this picture. Um, and then Pezzanite talked about distal tarsal and proximal metatarsal pathology. And then Clements recently, just last year, stifle pathology. Um, he also linked to other pathologies, but that was a new one. And then Walmsley, um, also last year, subchondral injuries of the metatarsal. Um, and then Mansman 2010 also talked about pathologies further into the trunk. Now, understanding the myofascial lines, that would make sense, wouldn't it? That they would be pathology further into the trunk. Yes, because as, as we've seen further up top, and if you look at the muscle connections, when you look at um, dissection pictures, where we later on are gonna have one, um, you really see how everything runs into each other. Yeah. And really like the, the dorsal, and, and the ventral superficial lines, they really start at the hind limb at P3, where both flexor and extensor tension attach, and also through the branches of the suspensory ligaments, they're merging into the extensor tendons later up. And yeah. it makes the hind limb foot stance so important for the whole balance and posture of the whole body. Because over semitendinosus, semimembranosus, it comes over and it attaches into the loin fascia there. And this is where we have the whole tension. From the ventral side, we have going into that big fascia that we have in the loin area. We have the diaphragm coming up. We have all the ventral muscles from the superficial um, ventral line attaching there. And it's kind of like a bow and the string that you have. Yeah. One is the spine and then you have the ventral muscles. So this is another one. We have the two uh, stay apparatus from the hind and the front and they are connected with the bow and the string of the whole thorax. So this is another connection that we have there. So could, um, could this posture that we can see in behind here, that could affect all the way into the thoracic um, Yes. Because all of these studies here, they connected negative plantar angles to, to these pathology. And yeah, so this long is, toes at negative plantar angles. Yes, so this is where the interesting talk starts because um, then we have to ask which causes which, right? And so for me, I'm questioning whether negative plantar angles are created by pain higher up and and for you you know that negative plantar angles are causing issues higher up yes. right i the, mean this is you get you get the vicious cycle and it's like the hen and the egg um you never know which one was actually there first exactly. so um yeah. let's talk about negative plantar angles so this is this is a radiograph of, of negative plantar angle um, and we can see that the pedal bone is has a negative um, compared to the ground surface. And 
And obviously that's going to pull on um, the superficial line, right? Yes. And we know that there are different grades of negative arm triangles. Um, it was written by 2010. Um, we've got grade one, which um, you often see at the end of a shoeing cycle, but they, with the correct trim um, and the correct of shoe, you can change it back to a positive. And, but grades two and above, um, they require more involved farrowing. And you can see the mechanical application there that, that I did. Um, and then grade four and above actually have a contracture of the superficial um, digital flexor. Um, look at what Mansman said, that these horses have a different posture. Um, we can see here the, um, the, the very clear stood under posture, camped under. Um, and we can see if we drop a line from the point of buttock, that should ideally go down the back of a vertical metatarsal, we can see that the horse is very much stood under. And also, um, the horses usually have a very high coronet trajectory. And you, you gave me this picture on the bottom right to show um, the different projections of the coronet to show yeah. that. Because I often get colleagues and they ask me, how can you say it has a negative palmar angle? One of the easiest thing to check is the projection of the coronary band. Yeah. If it, in a healthy foot, it goes carpus or lower, it's around the carpus. That means we yeah. have a positive palmar angle inside. Um, yeah. If it goes towards the elbow, this is already starting to get critical. That's why it's orange in my picture. Yeah. Um, because here we are around a zero degree, what's already too low, because in, uh, for example, Renata Veller in her study said everything under two degrees positive um, is in connection with lameness somewhere in the horse. And wow. if you have the trajectory of the coronary band going towards the belly, I can say without x-ray that this horse has a negative palmar angle. And yeah. this is really where the problems start to occur. The other yeah. ones might be like borderline, like some perhaps like not pushing properly forward from the hinds or like have problems with collection or, or cha lead changes or something like that. But if they have a negative palmar angle, these horses will have problems. They fall on the forehand. They have problems like um, breaking like when you tell them to go slower, they usually go faster and lean forward. This is a major complaint, what you hear. They don't want to collect. They don't jump properly anymore. Yeah. Um, these are sick things that you hear. And it's something that you can check easily from the outside. You don't need x-rays for that. And it gives you a very, very strong indication what's going on on the inside of the foot. I completely agree. And, and quite often, if I... If I notice the camped under posture, I will immediately look for um, the other signs of um, negative plantar angles. Um, because for me, if when they're standing like this, um, you, they're, they're immediately putting more load onto the heels. Yes. When, so, so for me, this is where I question whether negative plantar angles are created by pain higher up because if they're assuming this posture which crushes the heels and then crushing the heels obviously then creates can create a negative negative angle but also of course um, a negative angle can create the posture or perpetuates the posture and so you've got again you've got a chicken and egg situation and you've yeah. got a cycle as well haven't you and another thing that needs to be taken into account for developing these is the shoeing cycle. Because yes. in a healthy horse, the heel does grow slower than the toe does. And if they're not moving enough or properly or, or an, an on ground that is abrasive enough, those horses are starting to develop long toes. And this is going to push their center of gravity back and this is going to yeah. start to compress the digital cushion and they're going to overload the heels and then the yeah. cycle can start too. Absolutely and obviously when 
when the heels are run forward and they're not um, back at the base of the frog, um, then obviously those heels are then under, they're under the pedal bone instead of being under the digital cushion. And so they're, they're being overloaded with every single step um because the hemodynamic system isn't being able to work efficiently is it yeah and once once that system is overloaded the bad thing is like you have less blood flow to the heels because the vessels get compressed back there due to the load and then what they do is like they grow even slower and the front is growing even faster so you get into yeah. a very bad vicious cycle again yeah exactly so and then so for me that's what this posture does to the to the feet but um when they've got negative plantar angles in this posture you can explain to us a little bit more from this slide what it does to the actual musculature yeah these are nice dissection pictures from ivana rudok and what you can see on the right one is the hind leg um where sometimes anatomy is not as clear as it always is and you can see there um the gluteal superficial muscle is already removed and we see um, the, in, the intermediate gluteal. So this is um, part of the deep um, dorsal line for the fascia. And you can see it, those broad fascia connections. But uh, what I really like is the horse when he was alive, you can see how much tension there was on the tensor fascia lata. This is the broad, um, fascia or ligament band that we have there or how do I say connective tissue layer that we have there connecting the hip and the knee and that's also one of the major um, connection points for fascia be it for spiral line functional line um, also the the ventral line goes along there and you can see how much tension is on that one and you can also see how we have a hypertrophy of the gluteal muscle and also of the semitendinosus, semimembranosus. This is another thing that gets very prominent when you look at those horses and that have a negative plantar angle for a longer time. They have some underdeveloped muscles like biceps femoris, for example, and some yeah. hypertrophic muscle like semitendinosus, semimembranosus. What you can see in the dissection picture very well, like these, the muscles very at the back, they really stick out. That should usually be nice and round and even. And we have here yeah. semimembranosus really sticking out. And right. the biceps femoris that's written here, it looks kind of like very flat. That should be one of the strongest muscle in the hind leg because it's responsible to stabilize the knee and also to stabilize it so they can unhook the patella. And that's another thing what you often get when you have a negative plantar angle in the hind. The horses start to get um, knee problems because they also have tension in the lumbar fascia due to the... Due when to you the, say knee, knee you're referring to the five, five. yeah sorry yeah so that's um, obviously that goes along with clement's study from last last year yes that. he was just looking at um problems there um pathology like horses that actually have like um swollen stifles or problems in the ligaments but it's also when the when the horses are growing it can go the other way around if the lumbar fascia and bones grow too fast and the muscles don't stabilize enough, the innervation to the, to the muscles like biceps femoris and tensor fasciolata is not properly. And then they start to get um, upward fixation of the patella. And the same thing can happen because those muscles can't work properly due to the tension on the fascia. You also get upward fixation of the patella. And what so most you're saying all of this can can happen from from having negative plantar angles. It can, yes. And yeah. injecting the stifles is not really helping. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why they often need several injections. Yeah. Because this, this is what I'm finding is that um, not only does the hoof morphology perpetuate, but the higher pathologies perpetuate if, if the higher pathologies aren't treated at the same time 
that the, the feet are sorted out. Absolutely. Uh, because yeah. you have several, I call them construction sites. You know, it's like a big road and you have several construction sites. If you want to have the, the traffic going through properly, you need to work and clean all those construction sites. Otherwise, you're still going to get a traffic jam. Yeah, exactly. So this is where we lead on to some of the cases that I've done. Yep. Uh, so this is this horse with the picture on the left. So that was shod every four weeks, but this is how it how it presented every, on every four weeks, even with um, you know trimming the toes down and trying the, your best to create the correct angles. Um, but what I found is that the, the morphology and the, the, therefore the posture perpetuates unless you get the foot past a certain threshold where it begins to grow positively. Um, and so that's, that's where we get the progression from um, along these pictures, as you can see, that um, when you manage to get it past a certain threshold, you get that positive morphology. So initially, I put it in the wedge the wedges and i don't i don't like wedges don't put them in wedges for long but what i found is it really helps with the prolapse of, often you get very prolapsed frogs very prolapsed you use when you use wedges you also use frog support wedges right yeah, so these, these yes. are always frog support wedge pads with lots of indenture impression and for me it just helps to create the heels and the frog on the same plane mitigates the prolapse basically because these feet are often very much prolapsing through through the back of their heels um, so, and then I move on to the duo ellipses that you can see here and then as we get positive morphology then eventually like we can see on the right we end up back in flat shoes um, and you can see clearly how the posture changes so we started with a very um, angled metatarsal and then a better metatarsal and then finally a vertical metatarsal. Mm -hmm. And what I often also see is like the broken back hoof past an axis that you also have like documented very nicely here. Um, you have the high trajectory of the coronary band and also exactly. broken back hoof past an axis, the worse yeah. they are. Yeah, exactly. This, this change in posture is going to have a great effect on the rest of the myofascial lines, right? What were the complaints of the horse when it, when it started out? Um, well, this horse came to me a little bit broken, kind of had, it had um, kissing spines, it had SI inflammation. Like SI inflammation and kissing spine are something yeah. very, very typically going along with negative palmar angle. Yeah, and you exactly. can treat the back as much as you want. They will not recover properly, even with the best program, if you do not address the feet. And this is yeah. why I got interested into feet, yeah. because I had very frustrating cases like yeah, that. Absolutely. But the thing is, is again, we have to, we have to ask, um, was it standing like it is on the left? because of the SI or kissing spines, or did the SI and kissing spines come after it's standing like that? And that's, that's the question, because when they stand like that, they create the negative hoof morphology. Um, I think you can't question, uh, you can't answer that question properly. But what no, you can you say is most horses with kissing spine who don't have a shitty saddle or an unbalanced rider do have an empty <laughs> palmer angle. Yeah. Um, but then, see, it doesn't really matter which way around it is, does it? I mean, it no. does. But the, the point is, is that we need to intervene. And then this, yes. this is another case here. Um, and you can see how its posture was on first presentation. Um, and we managed, I managed to get it to the orange here without, um, with minimal treatment. But this, again, this horse had kissing spines again. So um, after he had surgery, that's when we began to get the green here. So Farrowy can go a certain amount of the way, but because of, it, because of the links along the myofascial lines, when the higher treatment is treated at the same time, that's when we really get the changes. 
That's yeah, it. it's it's again like when you want to when we want to stay with the road. It's like you need to work on all the construction sites to get everything running freely again. Yeah, exactly. And so, and the the way that for Farry, the way that we help with this relationship is to create the ideal proportions of the foot. Um, yeah. So we we want to we want to make sure that we're shoeing with enough length because I think you would agree with this. One of the biggest problems is not having yeah. enough length on the hind feet, um, and then that encourages them to stand under themselves because it. Uh, the yeah, because it's another thing that's going to encourage the heels to collapse when you have like too short of a shoe you create the pressure point right under the most sensitive part of the foot where we have the most loading or land when we land the most pressure and also when they're standing if the shoe is too short it's gonna pinch exactly where the cartilage is and so a too short shoe in itself can cause over time a negative palmar angle yeah. But also, we need to be careful not to shoe with too much length because then we can create leverage. Yes. So it's, we need to be careful. But for, for me, where I like to kind of shoe to is a line dropped from, from the center of rotation of the, uh, the fetlock and create a yes. right angle triangle with the, um, with the hoof pad angle. Um, yeah, and usually that's right along the heel bolts. Yeah, absolutely. Usually, if it's perfect in a healthy foot. foot. Yeah, exactly. And then for me, when we create this on the left, that's when we help to create the ideal of the whole limb on the right. Um, and then, obviously, that creates a kind of um, a kind of environment for the whole of the myofascial line. Then. Yeah. What you also see is like these horses are, have usually a very nicely muscled hind end where the others always look like very steep or kind of like, like they're missing some of the muscles. It's not round. It's more like, like a triangle instead of a ball. Yeah. Yeah. And you can, if, if we look back to this one, we can see, I think hopefully you'll agree. You can see yes. the change in the musculature. Um, yeah. and, and, and a lot of that's come obviously from the rehab work that, the other people in the team have done. Yeah. Um, so it's important to build up those lines. Um, you build up the musculature because as far as we can artificially create better posture, uh, but you also need to build up the muscles, right? And Absolutely. Because 80% of the stability from the skeleton comes from muscles. So if yeah. the muscles are not working properly, you can do whatever you want to the, to the bones and to the ligaments. They're not going to be able to hold up without the muscles and the fascia. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So um, there's another way of looking at it all. And um, we can see from this picture that the, clearly we can see the connection between the hoof and the body. Um, and I know you had some comments to make on, on this yeah. image. Yeah, this is like the, the apparatus that I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the bow and the string. The bow and the string would just be like in the middle, the connection that we have along the spine and the ventral abdominal muscles. So we have the connection front to back or back to front. Here in the hind legs, the lines around the part towards the tail would be our dorsal lines and the parts right towards the front end, in the hind end, they significant the ventral line that we have there and we see which muscles are in there. So we have the extensor muscles on the front and mainly the quadriceps and tensor fasciolata as the big player in the frontal line. And we have the flexor muscles, semitendinosus, semimembranosus and gluteus as the main players in the hind line, in, in the dorsal line. Um, yeah. You have it a little, your little picture in the middle shows it kind of like specifically for the lower part because they actually yeah. have P3, like mentioned earlier. And yeah. if we look front, we also see that it's not just 
the front is really important because we can't just look at it as a two-dimensional structure because it's different than the hinds. We do not have a bony connection between um, limb and thorax. Yeah. Because these muscles, the big muscles up top that we have there, like splenius and serratus, and they are really important because they work in three dimensional. They attach the limb to the body and also help with forward and backwards movement. Yeah. This is why in the front end, if we have problems with foot balance, it transmits directly up onto the trunk via those muscles. So if we have an imbalance in the front, it's going to react up on the trunk where the attachment of those muscle line, of those fascia lines are. So we're going to have problems in the front, up and the neck, where the line ends, and in the saddle area behind the shoulder blade, where our serratus and also the trapezius and um, deltoideus and spinalis attach. I know you've got you've got a couple of cases in a second, haven't you, to show us? For, yes. For the balance. So uh, I, when I look at this, I um, I see a suspension bridge, right? And um, what's interesting about suspension bridge, and again, this is coming back to tensegrity, isn't it? Um, is that it allows the body to be flexible and um, and move according to the forces that are on it, but also it means that pressure anywhere is going to have an effect everywhere else, isn't it? And then if we, if we look at the red lines that I've put at the bottom of the hind foot for, for negative plantar angles, we can see that the direct, if the direction is where they camp under and the heels are dropped, then you can see how that's going to pull on all of those cables along the suspension bridge. So have more, uh, more tension on the attachment up top. This is a perfect example when you look at that, that the problem that we see has a different origin. Because if you follow that one up, you have a problem in the lumbar area or often it's between the thorax and the lumbar area um, where we have kissing spine because that's where we have our transitional um, Spinous process, where it's the yeah. deepest point, it's at, at the end of the thorax and changing over to the lumbars. This is yeah. the point of the back of the horse. And this is exactly where these forces kind of like all run together and act when we have too much tension in the back. Yes, that's interesting because I've done um, a lot of thermography on these negative plantar angle cases now. And uh, more often than not, there's um, um, dysfunction in the caudal thoracic area, kissing spine. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that matches. So you've got a couple of cases now to show us talking about um, the link between hoof balance and heart issues, haven't you? Yeah. This is um, more, is it confirmation or is it compensation? So if you look at the picture on the left, this is how this horse um, presented. This is how she stands. If you she, look, she's either straight or slightly toed out. If you look at her from, from this point, if you lift her limbs up, you see that she's actually more of a toed in or straight conformation. So she's actually not trimmed according to her true conformation. What um, you also could see in her is that when she was landing, she was landing on the um, lateral side. So first lateral heel, lateral toe, and then she was um, flipping over and landing on the medial side of her foot. Um, if we go to the next picture, we're going to see the X-rays. Um, here you see the two X-rays. What you can see, especially on the front right, uh, front left, was that she has a P2, that's the second bone, that is actually slightly broken forward. If you look at their hoof passing axis, that is not straight. If you would palpate the horse, you would also see that she had a warm area 
on her P2 where we have this um, attachment of the suspensory. After we took those x-rays, we did an ultrasound and we found um, that the attachment of the suspensory was enlarged same as the straight sesamoid and ligament. And this is often happening when the foot balance is not correct. As we could see in that horse, she was slightly medial high on both feet. And that was also causing her to land laterally. Um, people often ask me, why do horses land lateral when they're medial high? I, I, for me, the best explanation is like, think you have a stone in your shoe that is uncomfortable to land flat on it. So you land on the other side where it's more comfortable and then roll over. And I think that's what those horses are doing. Yes, yeah, that's very interesting because um, as a farrier, you look very often, we're looking for how the horse lands. Um, and you know, taking what you've just said into account, sometimes we need to be careful that um, landing is a compensation rather than um, forced by the the balance of the foot yes i think that's what happens so it's really that's why for me it's really i think if we go to the next case i think we're going to see that yeah that's why for me it's really really important we need to do an assessment of the dynamic confirmation that means of the movement you have to watch how is the swing phase of the horse is it interfering is it like catching itself um, is it forging or, or is it um, striving? Because these are different things. And they tell you that something is wrong because there is hardly any healthy horse with a normal conformation that's not really extreme that is hitting or interfering if the balance is correct. Also, like I mentioned, watch the landing pattern. Is the horse landing flat with a slight heel first landing? If they're landing inside or outside, they either have a very crooked conformation or they have an imbalance somewhere. Um, where is the point of breakover? Do they break over laterally, medially or straight over the leg? This is very easy when it goes several weeks into the cycle then you see really easily where the horse is breaking over. Not where he was given the break over, but where it actually breaks over. Because the joints have a certain angle and that can't be changed. We can't force a toe-in horse to break over medial. Um, yeah, straight. That, that's impossible. They're all going to break over laterally. So um, what, so effect, what, what effect was that um, when we go back to this case here? What yeah. effect was that having on the myofascial lines? Um, what happens to this horse, either she had the swelling, she was slightly off in turns. She had a two out of five lameness at the trot and in turns. Um, she was very, very tight behind her withers and also very sensitive on her neck. Um, right. What's really interesting, I am often call it a little bit of cheating, if I'm pretty sure it is a foot, because the fascia lines um, and the meridians of the acupuncture, they run pretty parallel. And that's a lot of studies going out on now that the Chinese just found out where the fascia lines are and influencing them with the acupuncture. That's what happening, releasing tension in those fascia lines and having so an influence on blood flow and release of endorphins and all those things we know from acupuncture. So if yeah. you have those horses where I think there is a foot problem, I can just put in two needles at the foot, acupuncture needles, and if it's a foot problem, the tension behind the withers and on the neck is gone immediately, within seconds. They're no longer sensitive or painful there. This is a very easy test and, and it helps you to determine, do you have a foot problem or do you have a back problem? Like you said, sometimes it's very difficult to find out which one is the origin. Yeah. You can also have like a saddle problem that caused the same problem and will cause the horse to compensate later on in the, and in the feet. So yeah, it goes both ways. And like that for me, it's easy to differentiate. Is it a foot or is it a back? So you've got another medial lateral balance. Yeah, that's one for you because it's a hind foot. 
if yeah. you look at it, that's the left side. If you look at it from the front and from the back, you can see that's clearly medially high. What you can see in those medial high horses when you watch them move again, for me, dynamic um, assessment is really important. If you watch them land, they land most of the time, toe, uh, lateral toe, lateral heel, and then come in. And when they are in the stance phase and start to really load the foot, to unload the inside foot is they rotate outwards in their hock. And yeah. you also see they're not placing the foot straight. They're placing the foot under them, under the midline. They cross over the midline sometimes because they try to have the leg as straight as possible. So if the inside is longer, they just stretch under the midline a little more and then they still gonna land stretch because they make the inside of the leg a little longer by that if they cross over medially. And then obviously, again, that's going to have an effect on the myofascial tissues. And oh, yeah. They're all going to be very sore in the loin area. And yeah. also, they're going to have sore stifles. And they're going to have a sore coxofemoral joint. And also, the sciatic nerve is going to be under a lot of tension. Because it's what you do when they land all the time under the midline. This is like a stretch for the hip joint continuously. Yeah. And, and that's something that we can test ourselves. Just stand on your outside of the leg just for 30 seconds. You're going to feel how the knee on the inside is going to start to be painful and the hip joint starts to get tension. And you also get, again, a hollow back. You're going to go into a kyphosis. Yeah, so this just so, just so clearly shows how, um, how the hoof is affecting the whole, the whole body. Um, but can would would you say that if it had um, hip issues or knee or knee issues, um, stifle issues, that it could cause imbalances in the feet? Yes, it can, but it's very very rarely in horses to have original coxofemoral pain because even if you dissect them it's very rarely that you find arthritis in that joint it's more in the SI joint um, where they have problems but if you look at the soft tissue you find a lot of times that there is a lot of tension in there especially when they are medially high and in combination with stifle problems. Yeah. Okay. So when you show, when I saw those images, I obviously immediately wanted to show some images of correcting that medial lateral imbalance. And um, we can see here on the left how the medial lateral imbalance completely twists the um, not just the foot, but you can see the pastern also turning in um, and then you can see if you follow the red line up that's that's directly affecting the posture of the limb isn't it yes um, and then we can see when you from correct trimming and, and uh, re-establishing um, base symmetry and obviously we can vastly improve that um, but, but like you like you've had in this picture often when you have the shunted bulbs then it becomes a little bit more tricky yes because in the picture that for my case i mean this is clearly going on for a longer time we have about the thumb width difference from the outer wall to the inner wall and what happens is i mean as the hoof capsule is elastic this is kind of like pulling all the internal structures that we have there, the chondropedal ligament and all those, they're under so much stress because of those shunted heels. When they're medially so high, everything is at the maximum what the foot actually can do. So these horses are often lame due to that. 
and you have to release the tension immediately. So I would go with floating and putting a heart bar or whatever. Yeah. What, what would so be your exactly, go-to? Yeah. So that's exactly what we're going to go on to next. And that's, that was, that's, that's exactly what I would do if I had that bad a shunt. Um, and this, this is a, an example here where we've got shunted heels. And, and what I do is, um, which works for me, is I float the heel to the same extent as the amount of shunt. Um, yeah. And just allow that to have um, light work for a few days and allow that to, um, to relax. Cool. Like, like I said, everything is under so much tension because it's at the maximum of its elasticity. If yeah. you let it come down, what, what I think it's always very impressive. You have those like really big holes where you actually can put a finger in and then you wait two days and everything is gone and the foot has settled again and you don't see that shunt anymore. It's really, really impressive how elastic the hoof actual is when you think how stable and strong it is. Yeah, so that question whether the posture, um, <laughs> let's say that the horse has um, pathology higher up um, and it brings its hind legs underneath itself to support say it's back or it's SI. Mm -hmm. Considering just how elastic the hoof is, that change in load on the hoof could, um, or what I think does, um, mean that the heels exceed their elastic modulus and they start to collapse. And I think that's perhaps what starts to create, what can begin to create negative plantar angles. And of, of course, poor farrowy and um, poor hoof morphology can mean that it can happen the other way around. But for the majority of the time, I think that it's the forces that are acting on these hind feet um, that's overloading the heels. I, I think especially if they have a poor um, morphology or poor conformation to start with. Like yeah. If you have like massively toe... Um, base narrow, toe in or toe out, um, horses in the hinds, especially base narrow, toe out, this is going to overload one of the structures all the time. Yeah. So these are very bad candidates to go barefoot, same as, as in the front, when you have like very strong deviations from normal, you're going to see the same and these are kind of like the hoofs because the load, like you said, the load from top is always uneven when you have a conformational compromised animal. Um, yep. And then you get the same problem. It always going to need support to balance out those forces from the top as best as possible. Not, not just conformational um, issues. You know, you talked about most deceptive um, response if yes. um, if this posture is created by um, not just confirmation but by pain yes and, and there's several apologies. ways of pain you know you can have a horse with stomach ulcers that's always going to be bent slightly to the left it's always going to yeah. overload the left front it's always going to have a higher front a foot at the the right they often tend to get those high lows in the front where the yeah. left is low and the right is high, that's very typical for long time ulcer patients. Um, you can get the same in mares in the hind when they have like um, tumors. This is called fisterosomatic reflexes. That means we have a problem in the internal side that causes um, muscle problems or um, conformational problems on the outside. You yeah. can have also, like you said, trigger points from overworking. You can have um, confirmation problems due to a saddle that's ill-fitting, due to an unbalanced or too heavy rider. That's also something that we often forget. Yeah, Horses. so looking at, this, looking at this picture and what you just said, really everything can really affect everything else. And yes. And often as, as farriers, we're looking at the feet and we're looking just at the feet. Um, but it's so important to realise that 
the things that we're seeing going on in the feet, like morphologies and changes in, in its shape, could be coming from anything, really. And we need to ask those questions. It could be coming from, like you said, it could be coming from gastric ulcers, or it could be coming from a tooth problem. Or, or growing. Just growing in itself. If you have young horses, you know that yourself. When they're five, six years old, and um, they, they, they get longer in the back. The back gets instable for a few weeks. They have problems um, bending their knees properly. So they start to toe land a little more. This gives pressure if they toe land on the knees and on the stifle, uh, on, on the hocks and on the stifle. And that, that's pattern that you see. But this always, these changes are always pain related, no matter where and how. If it's yeah. like restrictions in the fascia, if it's real pain due to an accident, if it's trigger points in the muscles, um, there's so many possibilities and we need to work together as a team and we yeah. need to start to ask ourselves, what is the problem from what yeah. I see? What is the origin of the problem? And not just treat where we have the problem at the moment we need to exactly. think further we can't just treat symptoms we need to we need to really work out what the cause is yeah. and the interlinking between the hoof and the body you know again as we can see from this image that the hoof affects everything and everything affects the hoof um, i think that's a very nice sentence to finish yes i agree because we could talk for hours but we can end on that point that, you know, the hoof affects everything and everything affects the hoof. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So thank you so much, Martina. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. Um, I think we covered some great stuff and I look forward to maybe doing another one on another subject with you. It's, Absolutely. It's wonderful, wonderful pictures you made. Like I really thank do. Thank you like very much. Um, <laughs> And obviously, all, all my pictures are available to purchase through my website. So if you've liked any of them, then please feel free to browse my website. And, uh, and they're available as posters or, or as books. Um, Martina, thank you so much. Um, and we will speak again soon. Okay, bye. Bye.